Hey, good morning. It is good to be here today. Appreciate you guys coming out. Appreciate you guys joining us online. Will you stand with me this morning as we look at John 11, verses 21 through 27? I'm going to read these. You can follow along in in your Bible or on the screen. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Father, we're thankful and grateful for these words of Jesus from John 11, that he is the resurrection and the life. And Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds and our ears to hear the depth of this reality this morning. And God, I just ask that if, if in my ignorance I preach anything that's less than the fullness of your truth, you let those words fall to the ground, let only what is perfectly aligned with your truth and your reality take root in us. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, you can have a seat. So I have a question for you. Does anybody love to travel? I love to travel. I love to go places that just seem different and exotic to me. Um, Anybody else like that? You just like, if it's a different geography, I'm all about it. I want to see it. Here's my problem. My problem when it comes to travel is that I tend to romanticize places. So I get this picture in my head and I'm gonna go here and it's gonna be like this and it's, you know, and and all this and and the the picture in my head sometimes doesn't look anything like the reality. Sometimes these places that I like to go to, they just don't fit my expectations. I have these expectations and they don't align with it. So what I wanna do this morning is I wanna show you some expectations versus reality pictures of places that most of us, if given the opportunity, we would say, yes, I wanna go. So the first place I wanna show you is Machu Picchu, Peru. That's the expectation. And this is the reality. Yeah. Or how about this, Santorini Island in Greece. Has anybody been there? I'd love to go here when I see pictures. That's the expectation. Here's the reality. Or how about this? This, this is a Yosemite National Park in California. Expectation and reality. Or this, this is a good one, the Mona Lisa in Paris. Who wouldn't want to go see the Mona Lisa, right? Here's the expectation we have, and here's the reality of what it is. Now, this, this one explains so much to me. I, I understand something on a deeper level about our church after this one. This is Copacabana Beach in Rio de Janeiro. Look at that. That's the expectation. Now, here's the reality. See, the reason I like this one, because it explains to me why there are so many Brazilians here <laughs> instead of there. I know why you guys came. Look at this picture of Canatera Beach. <laughs> they came looking for a place to sit. <laughs> and so all of you that are watching online in Brazil, we have space for you. <laughs> you know, Unmet expectations can lead to bitterness and frustration and disappointment. In fact, there's a a sentence, a phrase in the world of recovery that says this, expectations are nothing more than premeditated resentments. Think about that for a minute. Expectations are nothing more than premeditated resentments. See, when we place expectations on ourselves or on others or even on God, We're simply setting ourselves up to feel resentment when they don't get met. And that's what happens. Expectations are a pitfall for all of us. All of us walk into situations where we have certain expectations and they don't get met. And then we blame the person or the place or even God. Had expectations and you didn't meet them when really the issue is that our expectations were unrealistic to begin with but we don't stop to think about that. And so in our text this morning, Jesus is going against expectations. 
And, and, he, and in doing that, he gives us a revelation about God that should shape our narrative of God as the healer, as our healer. And so as we examine Jesus' statement, I am the resurrection and the life, I think we're going to see three things that Jesus, by saying I'm the resurrection and the life, prove that God's a healer. We're going to see three things about God as the healer that are revealed in that statement. The first thing is that God reveals that he can heal any situation. The second thing we see is Jesus reveals why God as the healer heals any situation. And finally, in this text, Jesus shows us how we should respond to the God who is the healer. So we need a little bit of background before we can dive into this. And that background starts at the beginning of John 11. So Lazarus, Jesus' dear friend, and the brother of Martha and Mary is sick. Now, you might remember Martha and Mary from Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. Martha was busy trying to be a good host, and Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, and Martha says, hey, tell my sister to get up and help, and then I'm not going to give you the punchline because I'm going to encourage you to go read those verses this afternoon. But Martha and Mary have sent messengers to Jesus to say, hey, Lazarus is sick, And then in John 11, verses 3 and 4, we get the first bit of key information that reveals that God can heal any situation. Listen to this. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. See, Jesus, by saying this illness does not lead to death, is making it clear that there is no situation that God cannot heal. And in that moment, Jesus is surrounded by expectations, by the expectations of his followers. He's surrounded by the expectations that he'll heal his friend. And not only that, but there's, he's surrounded by expectations of how he will heal his friend. But he isn't captive to those expectations. Listen to this in verses five and six. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. He loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So he stayed two days longer. Now imagine this for one moment. Imagine I have a heart attack tomorrow. And during... (laughs) Thank you for the one person in the room. <laughs> and now imagine that, that Doreen says to you after I had this heart attack that she waited two days to take me to the hospital. And then you go to her and you say, why did you wait two days? And she goes, well, because I love him. That doesn't make sense, does it? I would hope that if she left me on the floor for two days because she loved me having a heart attack, that some of you would be upset about that. Now, some of you might be going, oh, well played. <laughs> but, but that's exactly what Jesus did. He gets word that Lazarus is ill, Lazarus is dying, and he stayed two days because he loved him. How does that make any sense? Listen to this in verse four. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. I am the resurrection and the life reveals that God can heal any situation. Jesus waiting two days to go created an any situation. By not going immediately, he allowed the situation to become something that everyone expected was absolutely hopeless. And then he went. That any situation that he was going to walk into was about to blow the expectations of everyone, even Lazarus himself, out of the water. Not because their expectations were too high, but because their expectations were too low. See, there's urgency in the Greek around this message that Martha and Mary sent to Jesus saying Lazarus was sick. And that urgency makes it clear that they thought his healing had to be accomplished quickly or it wouldn't happen at all. And so listen to to verse 21 in John 11. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Do you see Martha's expectation 
that Jesus is the healer, but her expectation stops short of Jesus being the resurrection and the life. Look at verse 24. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Martha expects Lazarus to rise from the grave at the last day, but not on this day. It's too late. He's died. Her expectation was not shaped by the fact that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Her expectation was shaped by what she had been taught, not by her experience of the person of Jesus. And then Jesus drops this truth bomb in the middle of her expectations in verse 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? See, Jesus destroys her expectations of when Lazarus will rise by revealing himself as the resurrection and the life. The resurrection to his Jewish hearers just moved from some future event that's gonna happen out there to a person in the present. It moved from some final act of God to a person who is here now. And by saying, whoever believes in him shall never die, he reveals that God can heal any situation and that he will heal every situation. So in Martha's mind, she's thinking, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But Jesus says, whoever believes in me will never die. Jesus, as the resurrection and the life, moves eternal life from a location to a quality of life in the present. A quality of life that's rooted in a relationship with the person of Jesus. Jesus brings Lazarus back from the dead to show that he is in fact the resurrection and the life, both here in this life on earth and permanently when this life ends. And so when Lazarus came forth from his tomb, Martha's expectations shifted from one day you will rise to this day he will rise. Jesus is the resurrection and the life today, this day, in our present situations, whatever spiritual, physical, emotional, behavioral, relational wounds we have or illnesses we face, are not beyond God's ability to heal. Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life, moves our expectations from God, will will God heal this, to God has healed this in the person of Jesus. The expectations shifted from one day to today because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So our first point of Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and life, is that God can heal any situation. The second point of Jesus' statement, I am the resurrection and the life, is to reveal why God heals. And Jesus tells us exactly why God heals any situation in verse four. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. God heals any situation for his glory. And he will ultimately heal every situation for his glory. And he does it through Jesus, who's the resurrection and the life. The only healer, so that Jesus is glorified as well. Now listen, I know that hearing that God can heal any situation can cause a lot of questions and despair when we are desperate for some healing. I know we can get stuck on why. Why isn't God healing me? Why is this continuing? I don't expect that what I'm about to say is gonna fully resolve any of these questions for anyone in this room, but I do think that it might help us in our hurts to shift our expectations just a little bit, to move our expectations closer to the reality of God. Listen, healing begins when we realize that our hurts and wounds are not problems to be solved, but circumstances to be redeemed. 
there's a big difference. When we approach the difficulties, the hurts, and the wounds in our lives as if they are problems that must be solved, we will exhaust ourselves trying to solve them. But when we realize that every brokenness, every hurt, every illness is a situation that God does not want and will redeem, then we can find freedom in that. Find freedom in Jesus as the resurrection and the life. And I want to tell you what redeem means. Redeem means being brought back into serving the glory of God. Everything that was first created was created to serve the glory of God. By the fall, those things became ruined. We are part of those things. And so Jesus as the resurrection and the life is redeeming everything so that it will serve the glory of God. Now here's why knowing that, understanding that, living into that can help us. When we view our brokenness as situations to be redeemed instead of problems to be solved, our circumstances, our, our perspective shifts from our circumstances to God's glory, which is to have the same mind in us that was in Christ Jesus. So then our healing becomes less about, I don't have to live with this wound anymore. And that's how I define healing. And it becomes more about God is glorious even in this wound. God is glorious even in this hurt. That is exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego experienced when King Nebuchadnezzar was about to throw them in a fiery furnace in Daniel 3, verses 17 and 18. Listen to what they tell the king when he's about to toss them in the furnace. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. You see, sometimes it's not the healing that glorifies God. Sometimes it's our seeking him in our wounds, in our illnesses, in our brokenness that actually glorifies God. See, when we're in deep spiritual, physical, emotional, behavioral, and relational woundedness, and we seek God with a but if not heart, we are glorifying God at a deeper level. A level that acknowledges that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Not because he has healed me, but because I trust that he is able to heal me. And that trust runs so deep that he doesn't have to heal me to prove that my trust in him is well placed. And that, that is some deep, next level trust. And see, we should be seeking to trust him in this way, even if it's mostly elusive to us, even if we can't seem to grasp it and live in it constantly, we should still be seeking to trust him in this way, to trust him in this way in the face of every broken and wounded place in my life. See, this trust says, my God can deliver me from this, but if not, I'll trust him. That's Job saying to God, though you slay me, I will trust you more. See, here's what I am the resurrection and the life reveals. It reveals first that God can heal any situation. It reveals that God heals for his glory. And finally, it reveals that we should respond to the God who heals. And our response is pretty straightforward. It's one word, pray, pray, pray for healing. Seek God in our brokenness. Seek God for redemption in those places where there's physical illness, in those places where there's emotional pain, where there's relational distress, where there's, there's behavioral chaos. To trust God in the but if not way is to keep seeking him and keep seeking him and keep seeking him, knowing that as we pray for healing, 
that the ultimate healing is the life of Christ in me. He may take this thing away, he may not. But I know this, I will be healed in my soul when his very life is coming to life in me. And so as we grow in Christ intentionally to the the degree that we can in this fallen world, none of us can get there fully and completely in this place, but as we grow in Christ intentionally to the degree that we can in this falling world, we are actually being healed. We are being redeemed. We are being brought back into the purpose of God. 1 John 3.2 says it this way. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Each of us is God's child now. And he can heal any situation now. And he will heal us, either now or at the appearing of Christ. But he will heal us for his glory. And so our response to this truth of Jesus as the resurrection and the life should be to pray for healing now. As children of God. And when the healing doesn't come, our response should be to pray for healing now as children of God. And when it still doesn't come, our response should be to pray for healing now. Because what you may find in that constant prayer for healing that doesn't seem resolved is that your heart and soul are being redeemed in such a way that the very life of Christ is coming to life in you. And these things that you think must go away for you to be okay, all of a sudden shrink into the background. It's the words of the old hymn. When I look upon his face, the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Think about that. What if our healing isn't that this thing goes away, but what if our healing is that we become the kind of people who can live with this thing? That's Jesus sleeping in the back of the boat. The storm's raging, Lord, we're dying. Yeah, I'm gonna take a nap. I'll just sleep through it. Why did he fall asleep in the middle of a storm that these experienced, seasoned fishermen thought was gonna sink their boat and lead to their death? Because he had the capacity to know that his life wasn't tied to his breathing, it was tied to the Father. I want to share a video with you now. It's a video of our our friend and brother, Reg Lumley. Reg is sitting right down here. Wave at the people, Reg. (laughs) I want you to hear his story. It's his story of seeking God for healing. It's a tremendous story. And, And it's Reg, in his need for healing, going to the one place where he knows healing can come from. And so, just sit back for a moment, and let's listen to to Reg tell his story. You want me to sit in here? I would like you sitting there. Hello, I'm Reg Lumley. A lot of you may not know me, I've been worshiping here for three and a half years. But the reason I want to tell you my story is because I had a miraculous healing. The doctors in London, when they first examined me, I'm glad they didn't tell me what they thought then. They just told me three weeks ago. They said, we felt you might live a year and you'd be in a vegetative state. I, I broke all their rules. They found me on a street in Sarnia and I'd smashed my head going down on cement and I had massive gain damage. I was hospitalized for two weeks in the trauma unit. I was bleeding internally in my head. I had fr- five brain operations in seven days. 
I could write a book unless um, when you have massive brain damage, it's like you have a computer in your head, a massive computer, and it's all damaged. And everything, nearly everything stops working right. Bladder control, just, well, uh, I don't want to tell you some of the things, but uh, it was a rough time. And uh, they felt I was only going to live a year, and they didn't expect healing. But my brain started healing, one thing after another. And when I go to London, they wouldn't say hi, Reg. They said, here's my miracle, man. It, it was a miracle. I had a miraculous healing. The doctor said he couldn't figure it out. I said, I believe it's a prayer. I said, I got a wonderful family, friends, church. Everybody prayed for me. That's the only experience reason we got. I am so blessed. Now, when they told me that it'd be up to a year before the brain totally healed, I've set all kinds of new records. I'm back to normal now. I still take more pills than I like to, but I eliminate, eliminate them in time. I have so much more peace. I have so much more love. I've come out of this as a better person. It's so peaceful. I hope nobody ever has to go through something like this. But I wanted to do this today for one main purpose to encourage everybody to pray. <laughs> There's no other explanation why I was healed. So thank you for praying for me. And thank you for your love. I need to get to know more of you. It's so hard. I have a little black book when I come on Sunday and I have a pen. I wish you'd come up and put your name in my book so I can get to know you better. Thank you again for all your love. <laughs> I feel like it just got a little warmer in here because our eyeballs are starting to sweat. Um, but did you hear what Reg said? Did you hear what he said? I have so much more peace. I have so much more love. I am a better person. That is the point of God's healing. When God heals, he does it so that the very life of Christ will come alive in us. So that we can be people who glorify him, just like Reg just did. Now that's not his whole story, there's more. His story is gonna be on our YouTube channel this afternoon, if you wanna go watch the remainder of that video. That was just a snippet of it. There are things in there that I promise you sound like a movie script. But that's what happens. That's what happens. And Reg knows, Reg knows now, it was never about him being physically healed, it was about him becoming the person who he is as he sits here today. And more of that person, because the person who sits here today looks more like Jesus than he did before this. That is healing. To become the kind of people who in the words of the serenity prayer can take this sinful world as it is, just as Jesus did, not as we expect it to be. The highest glory we give God is not in the healing, but in persistently and tire, tirelessly bringing our need for healing to him. That's where God is glorified. 
The asking is about living in relationship with God. The prayers of healing are about living in constant contact with the Father. And whether he heals in the moment or in eternity, it's about living in unbroken relational union with God. And just like for Lazarus, that can start today. You don't need some final day of resurrection to be resurrected when Jesus is the resurrection and the life. All you need to live in the resurrection and life now is relationship with the resurrection and the life, the person. Listen to Paul's words in Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11. This is what he writes, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now this Wednesday night, we're gonna have a night of prayer and worship, but our prayers are gonna be focused on healing. Healing for us as individuals. Healing for our church, whatever that looks like, whatever that may be. Healing for this community, for our schools, for the colleges, for our workplaces, for for this country, and for this world that needs a dramatic healing. But you know what, that healing for our families, and our schools, and our church, and our community, and our workplaces, and our world is probably, if God follows his pattern, gonna be manifest in a person, not a day. We are the people to manifest the resurrection and the life in a broken and hurting world. It starts with us. It starts with us. And that's why we're going to pray Wednesday night. That's why we're going to say, Lord, we're coming to you persistently and tirelessly to make us well, to bring to life in us the very life of Christ so that we can be the resurrection and the life in this world. So that people will see us and say, I want to follow who you follow. That's the goal. I want to leave you with some words from pastor and author Tim Keller. Words that that he uses to kind of tell us what these verses from Philippians 3, 10 and 11 should actually mean in our daily lives. Listen to this. This is what we're gonna do Wednesday. Look at the deadness in your life. Look at the anger. How is that going to be turned into forgiveness? Look at the insecurity. How is that going to be turned into confidence? Look at the self-centeredness. How is that going to be turned into compassion and generosity? How? The answer is that the dead stuff gets taken over by the Spirit of God. The minute you decide to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit comes into your life. It's the power of the resurrection. The same thing that raised Jesus from the dead. Shouldn't our expectations shift a little bit? Shouldn't our expectations shift to Lord, you as the resurrection and the life want to do something in me that's unheard of, that's unexpected, that will make the reality far exceed the expectations, that will shift our expectations from being too low to being rooted in the reality of Christ that has no limit for how high they should be. And so that is what it means to go to God as the resurrection and the life to say that I know you can heal me, but if not, but if not, but if not, you will bring a life in me that needs nothing but you to glorify you. Father, we're so grateful for this message, this truth that your son is the resurrection and the life. And God, we're grateful for the work you did in Reg's life. And Lord, I know that many of us in this room want that same miraculous healing. And God, we hand that to you. If it best glorifies you to heal Reg and not me, God, make me the kind of person who will glorify you in my need. Make me the kind of person who will constantly seek you to desire that every circumstance in my life is redeemed by you for your glory 
But Lord, no matter our state, let us never be people who find that our trust in you is undermined by our circumstances. Let us always be people who trust in you deeply and fully, regardless of our circumstances. Make us people who can live with hearts that say, but if not, but if not, you are God. You should be glorified. We want to live in union with you through your son, the resurrection and the life. And all else we hand to you and your sovereignty to redeem it as you will. But put in us the very mind of Christ that says, I can stand in all situations because you are with me, you go before me, and you will never abandon me. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.